What's up, War Room? Welcome back. Very special episode this week. We don't usually have a guest in War Room, but it's time. It's that time of the year. One of our guests from our original 10-part docu-series, which I think we recorded like five years ago, talking about how the hell did the Jets get into this mess? And here we are five years later having a conversation about the Jets being in a mess. Jason Fitzgerald, OTC Jason, the best in the business when it comes to talking salary cap. And we're going to talk that. We're going to talk roster construction. Jason, welcome back. It's good to have you back again. Yeah, I'm glad to be on again. So I guess let's just start big picture here. What is the Jets sort of overall health of the salary cap, health of their situation going into next year? Like how much flexibility are they going to have to improve this roster that very clearly needs some improvement? Yeah, so I think they'll actually have a lot of flexibility. You know, right now, I think if you look at it on a piece of paper, uh, they're ranked probably about 20th or 21st in the league in projected cap space. But most of those big cap numbers are all players on the defense. And most of those guys have all performed pretty well. So I would imagine that it's pretty easy to restructure those contracts. So, you know, I, I had run before I came on here. I just ran through it real quick and, you know, just went over – yeah, you know, your basic things like taking Quinn and Williams and just restructuring that deal, bringing that cap number down. Um, you know, John Franklin Myers bringing his cap number down, get rid of the two tight ends that are on the roster, you know, just cutting them completely. Um, you know, if you restructure a lot of the players that are on the defense, you could probably get up to, you know, we don't know exactly what the unadjusted cap is going to be next year, but they would probably improve their position by about 50 to $60 million um, for next year. So, you know, based on the cap projections we have, that would put them up towards $90 million in cap room. Um, if it hits a lower end, you know, about $75 million in cap room if they actually pull all those levers. So I, I don't think it's really that bad um, just because of where you see those high cap numbers. I know people are going to look at someone like an Alan Lazard and go, oh, you know, how can his cap number be, you know, whatever it is next year. Um, you know, I'm not sure off the top of my head what his, what his number is. Um, you know, that's one player. Uh, the majority of the guys are all on the defense, and they're all pretty good. Jason, that's pro it. It really has people wondering everything you just said because that's a lot of cap space they can manufacture if they need to. And we think Joe and I we talk about it all the time. You know, Aaron Rodgers coming back next year. We think it's going to be a classic all chips pushed to the table, and they're all in. Jets fans are wondering right now. Do you think they have enough flexibility then to extend Bryce Huff? if you have to franchise tag or find this bridge deal with Becton and still go make that splash that you need to, to try to get you over the hump, whether that's Devonte Adams or another big piece, judging from what you said, it sounds like they have the flexibility to do all of those things. Yeah, they, they should. Um, you know, if you actually are able to extend Huff and I, I don't, I still don't really know what the jets plans are with him. Uh, everything has just kind of been weird with that. But as long as you don't go the franchise tag route where you're going to be stuck with a cap hit of, you know, $23 million or something like that, if you extend a player even on a, let's just throw it out there, $28 million a year contract, you get a cap hit of probably like $7 million, $8 million, um, you know, the, the way that you can do it. So I think the, the big question for them is simply going to be, you know, can you get a deal done? You know, you haven't gotten a deal done all this time. Um, are you really looking for it? You know, or are they, you know, just going to let it kind of ride out and let him, you know, kind of walk? Uh, I, it, it's just hard to tell with him. Um, you know, with Becton, that would be a clear bridge deal simply because they just don't have players on the offensive line. Um, that would be a one-year deal. Figure that would eat up maybe $10 million in cap room. If you did it as a straight one-year deal, you could also do four void years in there and bring that number really low. Um, you know, that that's if they want to go down that route again. Um, you know, with him. So I, I think they'd be able to bring back players like that if they needed to and still have the flexibility to go out there and, you know, see who they can sign in free agency. You know, free agency is always, you know, kind of tough too. And, you know, they, they haven't had a lot of luck um, specifically on the offensive end with anything with free agency. But, you know, if they want to go and trade for Devontae Adams because Aaron Rodgers wants him to, if Aaron Rodgers wants him to go out there and sign Mike Evans or, you know, whatever GM Rodgers wants, <laughs> wants them to do with the team, you know, bring in Bakhtiari, bring, bring in whomever, whoever's out there that he, uh, he likes to hang out with. Um, you know, they, they could pretty much make that happen. Bakhtiari feels inevitable at some point for better or worse, probably for worse at this stage. It just feels 
inevitable. It's just another they lineman pitch. to get hurt. <laughs> All yeah, the, just another lineman to get hurt. Right. Yeah, more offensive line tetras for us. Um, big picture, Douglas has been at this for you know about five years now. Pretty long tenure, actually, when I was looking at it historically by Jet GM standards. like He's one of their like four – after this year, he'll be their like fourth longest tenure GM ever. How do you look at the job he's done overall big picture? I think the common – thing you hear from most Jet fans is like, look how much better he is than McCagden or Idzik. Think about how much worse things could be. And I don't necessarily agree with that sentiment because McCagden and Idzik were really bad. I don't think he's better to date than Mike Tannenbaum. I think Mike Tannenbaum retired with a winning record and multiple playoff wins. You know, when you get beyond that, you're getting pretty deep into the history. So where do you look at him sort of big picture wise, both from a Jets history standpoint, but then like league wide, like it feels like there's such extremes here. Like, I don't think he's one of the worst GMs in the league, but I certainly don't think he's anywhere near like the top 10 or top 15 with his record. He's probably somewhere in that like lower third, bottom half right now. What does the body of work tell you through, I believe, what is it, 77 games now uh, overall? Yeah, I mean, I I think if you compare him to the prior Jets general managers, he's better than John Idzik. Uh, I would probably put him on the same level as Mike McCagnan. Um, McCagnan had a one hit, um, you know, with his first season where he came in and, you know, kind of built that team, almost made the playoffs with Fitzpatrick as the quarterback. Uh, they had a couple of good draft picks in there, not great ones, but a couple of good ones. Um, you know, a couple of guys, you know, Quinn and Williams still on the team right now, um, you know, that have, uh, you know, kind of contributed. Uh, CJ Mosley, I think was one of his signings. Um, so, you know, you do have some carryover that's come from, even from him that's there. And, you know, when you, when you get into the results of it, you know, McCagnan's thing, you know, they, they didn't really go anywhere, right? They, they hit that high in the first year and then just kind of flattened out after that. There's really been no high here, and it's been pretty much below average. I mean, I think for the last five years when I looked at that the other day, I think they were the second worst team in the NFL. I think it was only the Panthers that had a worse record over five years. Um, if it wasn't – they're certainly bottom five if they're not no, bottom two. Uh, and in the last three years, I think they're like fifth from the bottom, um, somewhere somewhere in that ballpark. So it, it's hard to say there's really a plan where it's even progressing. You know, you look at a team like Jacksonville, who, you know, they've been bad historically too. And obviously they got a much better pick with Trevor Lawrence than we ended up with Zach Wilson. But at least that's a team where even though the record over the last five years or so has been pretty poor, there's at least a, a trend upwards in the last two years where our trend has just been some fluky wins, uh, you know, some luck and, you know, kind of hanging your hat on how good the defense has been. Um, overall, I mean, around the league, I, I think Douglas right now is probably a bottom third of the league um, general manager. It's hard to rate around the league. You know, you talk about Douglas being here for five years or whatever it is. GMs around the league are gone so quick that, you know, you're comparing him to guys who were, you know, like a Ryan Poles. I mean, he's been there. This is his second season, you know, tearing down a team. Um, so it, it's kind of hard sometimes to, you know, to kind of compare in that vein. Um, I think people that 